da das ilíacas e da veia cava. Muito obrigado, Arno. Uh, I would like to th initially uh, thank sincerely uh, Calogero Presti for having uh, uh, had the idea and the perseverance to start this program. I think it's a great thing to have this collaboration between the uh, United States vascular surgery, uh, vascular surgeons and the Brazilian surgeons who are considered the, one of the best in the world. So I think this is just the beginning of a big, big program and I'm sure that every year we're going to see a larger crowd uh, participating of the uh, Brazilian chapter of the SVS. So my sincere thanks to Calogero Presti for having done such a, a monumental job. Thank you. So my job today is quickly go over our experience uh, in, in the management of iliac vein stenosis with you. Um, I'm doing this now. Where's the... Uh I don't see it. Tom, did you take it with you? I'm just stupid. Aqui? Yeah, I did it, but it didn't work. No. No. Tom is very strong. He messed it up. Let me see. Ok, perfect. Thank you. Até as um, originalmente até as all right, so quatro e meia. Going back. So you know the obvious treatment for people with advanced venous diseases presented with ulcerations are compression, RFA and laser of the greater saphenous vein and small saphenous vein, the perforating veins. That's a little bit questionable, but we are doing in our practice sclerotherapy, stripping, and uh, seps. But what if that doesn't work? Why not just go up one step above and see whether there's iliac vein problem? And it's amazing that for 50 years, we never thought about looking in the more proximal portion of the uh, venous system, and we just concentrated on all the veins below the groin. Until Dr. Raju brought this up, at least as far as I'm concerned, he's the one who called my attention with this paper that was a series that spanned for about eight years, where he found that over 90% of his patients with venous problems or with venous symptoms in the lower extremities have actually iliac or femoral or uh, IVC uh, stenosis. And his results, once he fixed them, were excellent. Patients had less leg pain, less swelling, and they also healed in almost 60% of the cases. So I was curious about that, and I spoke to my, to my associate, Dr. Hingarani, and said, well, let's look at this stuff. Sounds logical to me that why should we stop evaluating patients uh, at the groin level, just look it up. So in a period of three years, we uh, did about uh, 300 patients, over 300 patients, but our population was a bit different from Dr. Raju. Ours, we had much more class four uh, and class three, uh, class four uh, uh, patients, the older patients, sicker patients, and the ones that had little ulcerations. He had more patients with edema and much less with ulcerations. And we evaluate the same way, we use the same protocol, three modalities, duplex scanning, contrast venography, and intravascular ultrasound. The technique was if you find more than 50% stenosis or 50% stenosis, that would stent these this patients. And then we, do, we did all three uh, investigative uh, methods in these patients. So the first one is a duplex scan, and we're kind of not really excited because we didn't see many disease, many uh, stenosis by duplex, especially in the iliac system. You could see the femoral, but the iliac was very hard. But we did, were able by abnormal waveform to detect some proximal problem or directly visualizing a mass uh, compressing the external iliac artery, a vein. Uh, however, the ascending contrast venography was much better than duplex scan, and we looked at the common femoral, the external, the common, and the inferior vena cava. And here's, a, I would like to concentrate just on this area point is not working, right here, where you're gonna see a severe stenosis right in the, here, right here. Severe stenosis very quickly. If you just wait too long, you miss it, right at the common iliac artery. And, uh, I'm sorry, and we now also found different types of stenosis. It was not all May Turner. We found long stenosis, short stenosis. Here's an example of a short stenosis that was stented. A long stenosis all the way to the ent entire external and the proximal common right here as you see, also was stented, 
successfully. And here's another stenosis right here. If you wait too long, you miss them on venograms. You really have to detect right when the flow is going. Here's this long stenosis. You wait long enough, you won't see them. And now I'm going to show you another example of a common, there's no Turner syndrome here. There's a common femoral into the external iliac vein that is uh, stenotic. With no extraction, there was no masses. There was really intrinsic compression of the vein. We also found that patients had EVAR, and you better start looking at your patient with EVAR who develop edema, that a, a good percentage of them would have iliac vein stenosis that requires stenting in these patients, and the symptoms would improve dramatically after that. And occasionally we found a patient that had a, a IVC totally occluded, and then we decide what to do later. But the fact is, without these evaluations, we will not be able to detect these conditions in these patients. So how about IVUS? We use all three IVUS, especially when we're doing this series in the hospital. Now we're doing mostly as outpatient. We're not doing this procedure in the hospital anymore. And uh, we measure the vein in three different segments, each vein, and also the vena cava. And here's the intravascular ultrasound showing the uh, common iliac vein. And you see immediately that the artery is compressing the vein right here. The vein is very compressed, maybe just a little bend, and then the same thing in the proximal external iliac vein. Right here, right here, same thing. So obviously, there's a stenosis. There's no doubt that this patient was symptomatic with this stenosis needs some uh, treatment. Remember, 25% of the patients would have stenosis with absolutely no symptoms. So you don't have to treat every stenosis, but if you are selecting the patients who have severe venous stasis changes, so those are the patients that you should treat if you find a lesion. And now we're doing mostly in the operating room. I'm gonna show you uh, in the office, this office procedure. And we have done uh, about uh, <coughs> close to 500 cases over the last seven months because our venous practice has dramatically increased over the last uh, few months. And we're just showing that we have an IVUS machine, an ultrasound, we have everything. In the, and we do all our punctures on ultrasound guidance um, for the skin. And also the trick is to inject lidocaine around the, the, uh, the femoral vein, just like half CC, so you won't hurt the patient when you put the catheter in. And we do the same thing with the arteries. So now we have the uh, 10 French sheet. We do our venogram that basically is normal, but I'll show you now on duplex. <coughs> Here's the uh, intravascular ultrasound catheter. We flush it in two seconds, two ports. We cover it, and we're gonna use now, uh, here, we're just connecting the catheter to the machine, to the, mo to the uh, motor, and we see the vena cava, as you see here. And as you go down to the common iliac, you see, very narrow, right here. And that was totally missed. There's a little band, a little short segment that was totally missed on venogram. And we see that all the time. And here we measure the, uh, the area. And if it's more than 50%, which here is more than three times, we do it. We mark on the monitor to make sure. And you see, as I placed the stent already, and uh, with the stent alone was not enough. I'll show you now, once we balloon it, here's the stenosis still there. So now I'm gonna have to just balloon that lesion, and after that, we're gonna really do a good job. But again, it was missed on venogram, and it was missed on duplex scan. And we do a completion uh, ultrasound that shows that the vein now is widely patent, despite the compression, attempted compression by the uh, artery. And we do a completion study just to make sure there was no perforation or no problem. So what are our results, initial results? 62% of these patients required a stent, not over 90%. But let me tell you, the last 500 cases, close to 500 cases we did, the percentage now is 82%. So as we learn more of this technique, we miss less lesions. So if you're very careful, you're gonna increase your percentage of detection of these cases uh, pretty much uh, more than you expected, actually. So we believe that IVUS is the gold standard, so it's 100% of the cases that we treated had positive IVUS studies. Venography 38, duplex uh, 15. Now these are basically a, a different way of doing them. We had 72% normal by venograms, and I was only 38% of the cases were normal. Now, 38% of the cases, venography missed the lesions, 133 cases. Uh, Ivis and venogram only agreed in the positive finding in 24%. 35%, they both tests agreed that there was no problem with the patients, and we found lesions on venogram that actually did not exist in 3% of the cases. So, stenotic lesions that were stented 62%, and IVUS and venogram agreed in close to 60% only of the cases. 
<coughs> we had complications, the same like Raju, and there's several reports now in the literature, and we basically are between two and five percent of complications, mostly thrombosis. Indeed, one patient had a contralateral iliac vein thrombosis, and we found out later that this patient had indeed a stenosis that was missed. And all patients were treated successfully with suction thrombectomy, thrombolysis, anticoagulation, and we're gonna talk about this tomorrow a little bit. But here's the patient who, who had a stent on the control our side, he had a long stenosis, and thrombosed this side. So when they had the, after the lysis, to fix it, we placed a stent, we opened the struts in this stent here, and we did a bifurcated graft, basically. We placed another stent, and we then we opened, ballooned it, and the patient uh, since then has done very well. It's been over a year. Also healed with stenting, much better without, without, than without stenting in these patients. And now I'm gonna give you an example so we can talk a little bit about acute thrombosis in these patients. This is a lady who is, happens to be the uh, sister-in-law of one of our residents, 32-year-old uh, patient who came with severe edema and pain in the left lower extremity, four days duration, and she was already on Lovanox, on uh, low molecular weight heparin. There was no history of hypercoagulability in this patient, no significant family history, and not on oral contraceptives, and no history of trauma. So we took him to the uh, operating room and we did this, um, venogram that shows occluded common femoral all the way and there's nothing reconstituted distally and you can see, see a lot of branches here but there's no main uh, vessel. So what to do in this situation? In our practice we use the angiojet which is a catheter that has a venturi effect and sucks the clot. To show you just a quick, uh, is the catheter going? Here's the catheter, it has a little opening, two openings and, and you suck uh, through it. You can also inject TPA under power pressure, and then as you suck, as you come out, you're basically supposed to suck all the clots. In reality, it does not happen, and most often we have eventually to use thrombolysis uh, with it. And this is the suction thrombectomy going up and down, uh, all the way from the vena cava down to the femoral. And you, what we found is that this patient probably had a chronic stenosis that caused all these collaterals to form. So now we knew that probably had an acute occlusion on top of chronic uh, situation. So we decided to, um, oh, just to show you that the other option that we had before we decided to do anything is just to put the trellis catheter. I just put it here for discussion, so in case you, any of you have experience with it. The advantage of the trellis is you have two balloons and you can limit the amount of TPA that you inject. And you inject the TPA here and then you start oscillating. Actually, it's a Fogarty, uh, Tom Fogarty invention, you oscillate the catheter to break the clot and to allow more contact with the uh, TPA with the clot, and then you suck the clot out and you're done and you suck the TPA also. So instead of doing that, we thought there was a stenosis and actually as you see the balloon contour here, there was a stenosis and we dilated it. We use a smaller balloon because we don't know about the size of the artery. Meanwhile, as soon as we dilated this vessel, the patient had a PE. She had severe chest pain, so what we did is we placed a catheter right there. Uh, this is just a completion study. We did a quickly angiogram. We did not open anything, although the stenosis was there. So we decided to leave a catheter uh, <clears throat> and unifuse from here to here to infuse one and a half milligrams of TPA per hour, and we took it straight to the CAT scan. Happened the CAT scan was negative, but the troponins were high. So obviously she had a very minor uh, pulmonary, pulmonary embolism, but the way she reacted, she, I mean, she was really screaming in pain, uh, was, was dramatic. So we brought her next day, she, she was okay. We brought her next day, and next day, uh, and we put a filter, before. that same night we put a filter, but we used a retrievable filter, because you knew we wanna put a filter in a young lady for no obvious reasons. So the next day we came in and we just stented it. Uh, it looked a little bit better, I could see flow into vena cava now. So we stented it, we ballooned it, and here the end result, it's all done. Uh, four weeks later, we brought her back and through a neck, in neck approach, internal jugular, went in and we snared the uh, filter, as you see here the snare, and then the sheet came out and we pulled the, the filter out, did a completion study, and every everything was okay with her. So we believe that um, if you have a stenosis, you should treat it in patients who have symptoms. Remember, 25% of patients will have stenosis normally in the iliac veins, and they're not diseased. It's just a natural way of these veins to, to be. Uh, now, if you have an ulcer, if you treat the stenosis, that ulcer is gonna heal a little bit faster than you expect. And uh, I believe in, in our experience, just to summarize that, in our experience, 
We strongly believe, but do we have a prospective randomized study to prove that this actually works? No. Are we doing excessive number of stents? Maybe. When we ask the patients, the quality of life is better in most patients, not all of them. Some patients complain of pain for, for two, three weeks after we place the stent. We have not solved this problem. I think one is maybe because we use the stent a little bit larger than we should. So we really have to measure that, uh, that cir circumference and try not to over distend these veins because they can cause uh, pain in the, in the, in the flank uh, after the procedure. Now, just an advice, if I can give you because I'm your friend for so many years. I think that the future of vascular surgery, a lot of it, is gonna be in office procedures. I know there's a lot of regulations here in, in the Brazil that prevents you from moving on this direction uh, because you need so many equipment for patient protection, but you know what? You can get over that very easily. So think about office procedures as your next step. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.